This is Nine News. Good morning, I'm Natalia Cooper. New South Wales has recorded more than 1,000 new cases of COVID-19 overnight and three more deaths as Sydney enters its third month in lockdown. Mark Burrows joins me in the studio now. Mark, there is a little bit of good news with some restrictions set to ease. A little bit of good news, as Kerry Chan just said in the press conference, Natalia, baby steps. Mm. 6.2 million vaccines, so this is the reward for everybody, those people doing the right thing. In the LGAs of concern, people in those LGAs of concern, the 12 areas that people are, the government is worried about, they will be able to leave their home for one hour of recreation. That's on top of exercise. So they'll be able to, able to go out, have a picnic, and that's just five people all have to be vaccinated. Those people outside the LGAs of concern in Greater Sydney, five people can now gather outside only if they are vaccinated. This is, they'll need a little bit of clarity on that. We're sort of wondering whether you could have uh, people over to your house if the only they were in your backyard. I'm not too sure that's the case, but certainly people can go out on picnics and there's a little bit more freedom there as they move out and about. Gladys Berejiklian is still pointing to the 70% threshold of vaccines, in which she says things will really start to reopen, but only to those people who are vaccinated. Here's the Premier. When you start opening at 70%, there are certain activities only vaccinated people can do. Uh, because we know that whilst a certain portion of the population is unvaccinated, that poses a risk to, to too, too many people. So for that reason, we're asking industry to dust off their COVID safety plans, get the QR codes in check. And we're also working on an app in New South Wales that will allow you to sign into a venue, but also have proof of your vax all in one to make it as simple as possible. So, Natalia, there was a lot of talk about hairdressers and uh, uh, beauty salons opening. That has not been the case. These uh, new uh, easing restrictions don't come into effect until the 13th of September, so still two weeks away. Um, and Kerry Chant, who really had to sign off on these, is happy enough with them. As she says, they're only small steps until we reach that 70% threshold. OK, Mark, thank you. There's no doubt the consistent increase in COVID numbers is causing additional pressure on our hospital system. We'll go live now to Grace Fitzgibbon, who joins us at Westmead Hospital. Grace, what are you seeing there today? Good morning, Natalia. Yes, very busy out here at the Blacktown Hospital this morning. We know that this pressure is increasing daily right now across the state. Uh, around 80% of the intensive care beds are full, 17% of those with COVID-19 positive patients. And from today, Westmead Hospital is operating short stay units in the emergency department where patients will be triaged to manage these rising case numbers. While here at nearby Blacktown Hospital, patients are being screened and swabbed in these pop-up tents in the car park here. It's hoped that this temporary system will help free up ambulances with paramedics being told to redirect some COVID-19 patients as far as the North Shore to hospitals there with less capacity in recent days. At Westmead Hospital, to give you an example, last week alone there were 280 COVID-19 patients delivered by ambulance, triggering the hospital's code yellow alert. We heard from a patient there yesterday. She uploaded a video on the internet where she was essentially being treated in the car park and left to wait for around eight hours. Take a listen. I'm in a tent now. They're getting ready to take me in. All of those cars are all COVID. They're all waiting to get into the red zone. This is the red zone over here. Natalia, I've spoken with the paramedics union this morning. They do welcome this temporary plan, but they're not entirely convinced it will help with the wait times or the ramping. We'll hear from them in detail a little later on. Grace, thank you. Less than half of Victoria's 80 new local COVID cases were in isolation for their infectious period, but young people are still flocking to vaccination hubs to do their part. Isabella Stavshkoski with the latest. It looks incredibly unlikely that Victoria will exit lockdown six next week, recording another spike in cases. 80 new local infections, 41 have been infectious while in the community and 13 a mystery cases. Testing numbers though are up, a little more than 56,000 test results received. This is the line here at Jeff's Shed this morning, just one day 
after the 16 to 39 year old age bracket was eligible for Pfizer vaccinations. People lining up since the early hours of the morning. So many that by 9am staff confirmed walk-ins would no longer be accepted for the rest of the day. Authorities are further shifting their focus to young people. It's been revealed children and teenagers make up a third of our active cases. Atagi is now looking at approving the jab for 12 to 15 year olds while Victorian year 12 students will be prioritised. The aim is to inoculate the cohort before October. If all of us do our part and get the jab, we're hoping that we'll be at least our, our school kids will be allowed to go back. While in some good news, a Royal Children's Hospital study of 170 children found kids are recovering well, even with Delta. Some doctors still say vaccination is a needed additional safeguard. And while our healthcare system continues to be put under pressure with staff being furloughed and having to isolate hundreds of medical professionals, doctors and nurses will soon be flown into Victoria to assist at at least 30 medical centres. Residents in the regional Victorian city of Shepparton are struggling to get groceries and other necessities as the state's COVID crisis forces at least a third of its population into a 14-day quarantine. Details from Mimi Becker. Testing sites are extremely quiet in Shepparton this morning as the city struggles to cope with around 20,000 people isolating. That's about a third of its population as part of this latest COVID outbreak. There are reports some families have gone without food for days. Supermarkets in Shepparton have been forced to cut hours due to staff shortages. Home delivery and click and collect orders have also been cancelled due to the overwhelming demand. People struggling to buy the essentials, baby formula, nappies and access medications. 50 members of the Australian Defence Force are expected to arrive in town today to assist with testing, door-to-door -door checks on people isolating and to help distribute supplies. There are around 100 exposure sites in the Shepparton region with multiple schools across the city closed as thousands of families isolate at home. Healthcare workers have been furloughed while fully vaccinated members of the community who are not isolating are now stepping up, volunteering their time to deliver supplies where they can. The local mayor and health department have warned that case numbers are expected to rise in coming days as well as that growing list of exposure sites. Let's go live to Peter Fegan now, who joins us from Toowoomba in Queensland, where a new hotel quarantine facility has just been announced. Peter, construction has begun. <laughs> Natalia, a very cold to Woomba, I might add. Yes, it has. Behind me there, you can probably see this grater. That there is stripping the first lot of topsoil. Natalia, this is what the Queensland government always wanted, a purpose-built quarantine facility. We know originally they put the idea to the federal government for them to pay for it, but the federal government pushed back. And today's announcement couldn't have come at a better time. We know yesterday that Queensland essentially shut its doors to people trying to return to hotel quarantine because they say we're full. A lot of questions, Natalia, have been put to the Premier today. First of all, how much is it going to cost? She couldn't... Well, she wouldn't answer that. Second of all, who was it going to be for? So... It's 500 people by the end of the year. It's going to be built by the Wagner family, who are a very well-known family in the area, and I guarantee you it won't take long. 500 people by next year as well. It'll cater for everybody. There'll be single rooms, double rooms and family rooms. But another, a number of the questions that she couldn't answer today were what would happen hypothetically if there was a breakout in a town like Toowoomba? She sort of bypassed that question. And one of the federal government's big pushbacks on this idea was the fact that Toowoomba Hospital couldn't handle an influx of COVID patients. So what happens to those people? Well, they'll be airlifted to Brisbane or taken via ambulance. Here's just a snippet of what the Premier said this morning. The best way to keep you safe and to keep Delta out of Queensland is to build as quickly as possible a regional quarantine facility. Natalia, two more major points worth noting is that this facility goes a long way to suggest that Queensland will have hotel quarantine in place for some time, despite the, the federal government's 80% uh, vaccination rate. And another thing was, I asked the Premier, what would happen if we quash hotel quarantine here in Queensland? What would happen with this facility? Uh, one suggestion was the 2032 Olympic Games, uh, the Athletes' Village, which she actually quite, she said that was quite a good idea. So there you go. Oh, OK. All right, we'll see what happens. Peter, thank you.
There's concern for an Australian citizen in Kabul after distressing video emerged of him appearing injured in an altercation. We'll go straight to political reporter Fiona Willen in Canberra. Fee, what do you know so far? Well, Natalia, we've been told the man is alive, but he is fearing for his life and he's hiding. So his family has told Nine News that he was beaten by the Taliban on his way to Kabul Airport yesterday afternoon. Uh, this video of the aftermath has been circulating online and in the footage, the man can be seen with a bloodied head uh, and heard saying that he's an Australian citizen. You can then hear some gunshots before the video cuts out. Now, the federal government was overnight trying to verify the man's identity and check on his welfare. This morning, his family has told Nine News that he's been instructed by the Taliban not to go to the airport. Uh, international evacuations continued at the airport overnight. The PM says another 1,200 people were airlifted on six Australian flights and one run by New Zealand. The group included Australians, Afghans and people from other nations. So this brings the total to more than 4,000 people airlifted so far. Uh, but now the Australian government's travel advice has changed and Australian citizens are being told not to go to Kabul airport. Uh, today, the foreign minister spoke about the updated advice while the prime minister said what it meant for evacuations. Those operations remain uh, in place. They continue even now, uh, but the situation is deteriorating and uh, we will continue to operate uh, safely, uh, but paramount in our operations is ensuring the safety of those Australians who are directly involved in the evacuation effort. Our clear travel advice is now do not travel to Hamid Karzai International Airport. There is an ongoing and very high threat of terrorist attack. Allied forces now have less than a week to get out of Afghanistan. Natalia? Fiona, thank you. A bold plan from Qantas to get us flying overseas before the end of the year as the airline tries to recover from a massive financial hit. Shots fired at a family home in Sydney's west. A nine-year-old child caught in the crossfire. And Kanye West may soon be no more. Why the rapper wants to legally change his name. Qantas has reported a $1.7 billion loss in the last financial year as planes remain firmly grounded during the pandemic. The Flying Kangaroo suffered a 58% plunge in revenue in the 2021 financial year, with COVID expected to cost the company $20 billion. But CEO Alan Joyce is confident the fleet will be flying over international waters later this year. We expect flights to countries with high vaccine rates to resume from mid-December 21 onwards. That includes Singapore, Japan, the US, the UK, and hopefully New Zealand. Flights to countries with higher rates of COVID would not resume until April. Let's go to Western Sydney now, where shots have been fired into homes at South Granville. Lauren Tomasi is live for us. Lauren, take us through what happened. Yeah, Natalia, certainly a, uh, just a terrifying set of circumstances for two young families who have been caught in the crossfires. Police say that witnesses have heard multiple shots fired in this park here in Auburn last night around 7.30pm. To my left, a house on the corner there, a bullet has gone through the fence, pierced through the fence, inside a young pregnant mother, her three-year-old daughter and husband. Uh, certainly left terrifying by that scene. Uh, on the other side of the park, around 400 metres away, a second home has been impacted in Inside that home, a mother, father, a nine-year-old boy and a 14-year-old girl. Uh, that family found the bullet pierced through the, uh, the parents' bedroom window and embedded into the back of a door. Let's take a listen to what they had to say. He scared too much and he shocked and he said, Mom, Mom, come to, to look this. What's, what's this? Because you never see like this before. Police at this stage don't believe that the shooting is a targeted attack. Uh, it, it appears random. terrifying ordeal for both those families finding bullets in their family home. Uh, police have been going through this park today in line searches, going step by step along with the dog squad, trying to uh, identify any sort of evidence that they can find to work out what exactly has happened. Uh, police are appealing for any, any witnesses that have been in this area or around Webb's Park uh, to come forward, Natalia, but certainly grateful that no one was injured. OK, Lauren, thank you. 
Firefighters are sifting through rubble, searching for any survivors of a collapsed building in Spain's Valencia region. Rescuers have so far found one person who was conscious and pulled them to safety. Engineers are also at the scene to determine how the three-storey apartment tower came down. A tornado has torn through a neighbourhood in China, damaging at least 50 properties and ripping dozens of trees from the ground. Power has been cut to the impacted streets with emergency crews now assessing the damage. At least one person was injured and taken to hospital. Rapper Kanye West has filed court documents to formally change his name. The former husband of Kim Kardashian wants to shorten his full name to just Ye with no other first or surname. The paperwork cites the changes for personal reasons. The rapper has also said he was inspired by the Bible for his new moniker. We've got breaking developments next on Nine's Morning News surrounding AFL coach David Teague as he learns his Carlton coaching fate. Plus, the Dragons turn their attention to building for next season. And the Australian Reptile Park celebrates an incredible but dangerous achievement. To breaking news, and after a heavily drawn-out process, Carlton has finally made its move, sacking coach David Teague. Alicia Mewling is in Melbourne for us. Alicia, this isn't really a surprise. No, it wasn't, Natalia. David Teague spent about a couple of hours here at Princess Park this morning before leaving the club for the final time. So most were expecting this sacking to happen a lot sooner, perhaps on Monday after the end of the home and away season. But it's taken the Carlton board four days. They finally put David Teague out of his misery. So this was the culmination of an external review that was launched some months ago. It's a process that's been heavily criticised for being long and drawn out and unfair to David Teague but in the end the footy club led by new president Luke Sayers agreed that he wasn't the man to take this club forward in 2022 so now the hunt is on for their fifth coach in nine years Natalia Ross Lyon is in the box seat at this stage all right we'll wait and see what happens Alicia in Melbourne thank you St George Illawarra is determined to send its outgoing players off on a high while continuing to build for next season. The Dragons face the Cowboys on Saturday afternoon and mathematically still have a chance to make the finals. Although it's unfortunate that like some boys won't be here next year, but majority of the group will be, so um, we definitely want to finish the year strong and show um, obviously what we're capable of, but put a, um, you know, a foot in the right direction uh, coming into next year. A crucial final shaping clash to begin round 24 tonight with the seventh place Knights taking on the ninth placed Titans. Serena Williams' long quest to equal Margaret Court's record of 24 Grand Slam singles titles will drag into 2022. The world number 22 has withdrawn from next week's US Open in New York with a hamstring tear. It's the same injury that ended her Wimbledon campaign earlier this year. Arsenal has bounced back from poor Premier League performances to win its League Cup second round clash against West Brom. The Gunners found six goals against their championship opponents. Meanwhile, Southampton put eight past South Wales side Newport County. England has made a phenomenal start to the third cricket test against India. James Anderson took three for six as Virat Kohli and his team were rolled for just 78 on the first day. In reply, the home side at Stumps are none for 120. And Australia has claimed an amazing four gold medals on the opening night in the pool at the Tokyo Paralympics. William Martin won the men's 400 metre freestyle S9 class, while Lakeisha Patterson won the women's event. Rowan Crothers touched first in the men's 50 freestyle S10 before Ben Popham backed it up in the 100 freestyle S8 race. It takes our tally the six gold, one silver and three bronze, currently in first place on the medal count. That is great. They're terrifying and venomous. So, as you can imagine, it's been a very delicate operation to get the Komodo dragons at the Australian Reptile Park to mate successfully. It's an Australian first, so staff at the Central Coast Sanctuary are very excited and they're waiting for the eggs and some baby Komodos. These vulnerable reptiles are the world's largest and can grow to four metres long and weigh up to 100 kilos. It's all very Game of Thrones-esque, baby dragons. All your weather details are coming up right after this break.
A quick look at the national weather now. A sunny top of 22 in Brisbane, 18 for Sydney, cloudy and 14 in Canberra. Just 13 in Melbourne, a light shower and 12 in Hobart. Overcast in Adelaide, Perth showers and 19, a hot 34 in Darwin. A sunny top of 24 in Brisbane tomorrow, Sydney the chance of a shower and 19, a wet one in Canberra, cloudy and 15 for Melbourne, overcast in Hobart. A sunny 18 in Adelaide, 18 also the top in Perth and clear skies in Darwin. And for the first day of the weekend, blue skies in Brisbane, some cloud over Sydney and Canberra. Melbourne will be sunny and 18, overcast in Hobart. Adelaide's looking at a couple of showers, Perth the top of 19 degrees and Darwin being very consistent there, sunny and a hot 34 degrees. And that's Nine's morning news. We'll be back at 4pm with your afternoon news, 5pm in Adelaide and Perth. I'm Natalia Cooper. Have a wonderful day. Previously on Desperate House.